Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art and music, focusing on the very first LP by The Strokes, and that is, Is This It?, to hash it out, I'm joined by one of our favorites now, one of our go-tos. That's right. It is 1L Philip, Mr. Ooh, Church. The extra respect for the, <laughs> for the L situation. I appreciate it. <laughs> Mr. Church of philipchurch.tech. Welcome, Philip. I almost said welcome, Novo. <laughs> thank you, Novo. Well, welcome, Novo. Yeah, yeah. I, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. We are both here now. Let us go. <laughs> And uh, today we're talking about Is This It? Yes. Uh, the very first LP by The Strokes. Let's frame our piece. We wanted to talk about this today because it was 2001. It was a simpler time. <laughs> it was a better time. This is the time when Alternative Rock decided to get uh, real fucking weird. You know, with like, we just had Kid A uh, a year before, 2000. Oh, yeah. uh, EDM, electronic dance music, was really starting to find their mainstream feet and an audience. And also a time when rap and hip hop decided to go a little more pop. So what did the people yearn for? They wanted something simple again. And kind of through the middle of the industry at the time came came this album. Uh, the people just wanted a good old fashioned four on the floor. Some rock and, rock roll. and roll. Right. Uh, so with the number of contemporaries at the time, is this it essentially helped to pave a revival and more importantly, a renaissance for just classic good old fashioned rock and roll so um before i pass it to you to kind of add to this thesis yes i i wanted to i wanted to tee you up with this okay. i when i was um reading the history around this album i want to say that a lot of bands after is this it owes them an incredible debt like Arcade Fire, Kings of Leon, yep, like all sure. these bands that focused on good old fashioned guitar, rock and roll, owe this album an incredible debt. Yeah, them, that and others. I mean, other stuff comes to mind like uh, Black Keys. Uh, you know, there's oh, yeah. so many, so many different bands that kind of, yeah, carried on this interesting new like legacy or whatever uh, of this. Yeah change in in rock and roll or at least alt rock whatever you want to call it at the time because it wasn't of... alt rock you know it was like true it's almost like they were um reviving the spirit of the late 60s and 70s that's why they often get co compared to the velvet underground yeah and i mean the you know casablanca is the main guy uh as well i'm sure we'll discuss further in just a moment um, oh yeah he, he very much considered um now i'm blanking on the name but anyways the velvet Over underground um sort of like the, lou reed lou reed thank you yeah yeah uh, he cited him as inspiration big time and and you can tell I me mean, you can tell it's so it's classic and timeless i think that's part of why it's just so easy to listen to it and why it just had such mass appeal because it is it is in in a weird way like modern but classic like modern classic rock and timing is everything i i wanted to talk about this because um again as an amateur musicologist they you know they came at a perfect time that's why i kind of was talking about all the other things around it before i went into what people were still yearn yearning for they wanted something simple again they didn't want the weird they didn't want edm quite yet they and they were probably getting sick and tired of of all of the mainstays and remember this is a time when like packaged pop was people were mastering that you know the days of britney spears and nsync and backstreet boys you know were really big at this time and so i think a lot of um not only an older generation or even mid generation and and definitely a younger generation was like i just want you know i kind of want to hear what my my parents played for me growing up you know i just want something simple again and they got that and i um i, I like to put it into a cultural and date specific context because i i i always think about this like if this came maybe 10 years before or even 10 years after would it have the same success and I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Uh, the gold standard for me is the police. When I think of like the police's sound, I'm like, could they have really found as much success as they did if they came like decades after um, they really hit the scene? And I, I don't I don't think so. So I, I, I want to frame the piece that way as, as well. Okay. Yeah, that, you know, it this 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 album was a little bit of a lightning in the bottle situation, a little yeah. bit of a watershed moment. 
I can see my, that. My I can humble see that for opinion. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, before we can discuss, of course, we all need a little background. So the band was formed in 1998 in New York City. It consists of singer Julian Casablancas, as Philip already said, yes. guitarist Nick Valenci, uh, guitarist Albert Hammond Jr., bassist Nikolai Frater, and drummer Fabrizio Moretti. The album Is This It was released on July 30th, 2001. It was produced by Gordon Raphael, and it clocks in at a very modest 36 yeah. minutes and 28 seconds. It does kind of fly by, but at the same time, it's just, it's because it's kind of just all go. Again, it is just classic rock. They just, they don't waste time. All the songs are just nice, like boom into the momentum. And they're all just really upbeat, like quick songs. So, uh, and, and interestingly, it, it used to have an extra track on it. Oh yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, New so York City. It cops. used to, it used to clock in a little longer, <laughs> but uh, not. That well, much. it was. Um, I believe it was in place of what they used for the U.S. release. Um, so yeah, hold that thought. Put a pin in that. I do want to get. I do want to yes. get there. And I, I will say this before we um, hear from our sponsor, and that is. I think this is an example of this is probably the how should I put it least <laughs> uh, amount of time you can really consider this or you could really consider an album of music a f- full LP. I feel like just a few minutes, definitely if we were getting closer to 30 minutes, it would have been just an EP, an extended play. Yeah. But I feel like they went a little past that 35 minute mark and this is the least amount um even i mean I, I i would say nowadays it's a little more commonplace because we have a completely different music industry but when the cd was still king this was still a very short album which is 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 even fascinating for its time when we you know in the vein of our, our um queens of the stone age album i mean they were they were heavy albums over an hour oh, almost yeah. every time and so uh, it was fascinating i think to see it from that context as well but before we get there of course we need a little word from our sponsor this episode is brought to you by the novel the entropy sessions a tale of loss love and madness and our past present and future relationships with technology find it on amazon and as an audiobook through audible your support helps us continue our journey now back to the show now as we enter the discussion section i want to start with this question for you I want to understand why this album is so celebrated Uh, because uh, time and time again, I should tell you guys, all all the good people listening, uh, the original conception for this show was going to be a full career episode on the strokes, like every album, everything they did in between. And the more and more I studied their career, I found that they could never really, they never really found the commercial and critical success they found on this is this it? And I saw it. I, I kept seeing it over and over again, Philip, on best of lists. Sure. You know, best of the year, best of the decade, best of the century. An amazing album. Yeah. And so I and I've listened to it many times before we've done the show. And this is another example of I really, really like the strokes. I, you know, I really, really like this album, but I just didn't quite understand why. So that was part of the reason I wanted to focus on this because it was really, I don't want to say the apex of their career, but I mean, they changed the game (laughs) from the get-go and they could never really reproduce it again. And I wanted to truly understand why it is so celebrated. So Philip, tell us, in your humble opinion, why it's so celebrated. A lot of what goes into getting this album so celebrated is how much of it is an intersection of really, really honed talent Mm. and really good chemistry, as well as, um, like you said, some of the timing of it, uh, that lightning in a bottle aspect. But, you know, in looking this, looking back into the strokes a little further, I, again, it's been a while. So thinking about the show, I actually like went back and, of course, did my homework and was doing the research. Yeah. And not only did a lot of these dudes happen to meet each other in their like youths, not that they're terribly old or anything. Like it's not like they weren't uh, still obviously very young. Well, when they made this, they were like in their twenties, right? Something like that. Yeah. Early twenties. I mean, they were still they were still like they were kids. Young yeah. yeah. So um, 
but even even like younger still, like some of them met when they were in like more like elementary school age. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them you will also learn like there's the, another interesting intersection or overlap where they've all most of them were have been like lifelong musicians of like, oh, they started when they were like six or eight or something. Um, I didn't really look into the schools and all the stuff that they definitely did. But I mean, regardless, yeah, not necessary. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's okay. yeah, unnecessary. But just we know that they're they're very uh, seasoned musicians. They, well, right. And yeah. Let's so knowing that they attended, you know, um, some they were educated, well-educated. Well, that and and, you know, like they went to school around the world. So I just I feel like there's there's a whole lot behind just that of just who like the the more worldly like group of people, like all kind of New Yorkers. But even still, like, you know, like Casablanca's dad was like Spanish and his mom was like Swedish or Swiss or something. I forget, um, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, Albert Hebben Jr. also grew up in like. Uh, somewhere in Europe. So yeah, a, a lot of interesting things had to happen. And these guys um, practiced their asses off because this was, this really was their, their first real release. The, uh, the modern age, I believe was the EP that came out. Um, exactly. Yeah. Right, right before, before this, but it, yeah. was, it was still essentially like the same songs. Yeah, exactly. It helped them get signed. It helped them get recognition. And then when they actually had the support of a record company, you know, then that's when they were like, OK, we need to we need to make a full LP and get ourselves out there. Start touring. Yeah. And they did just that. And that's, again, going back a little bit to the thesis, that's why that's why a lot of people look to this album. That's that's essentially what I got in terms of why it is so celebrated is people like historians often trace the beginning of the 21st century in, in terms of this particular genre. And we'll just use the umbrella term of rock and roll or rock. And they, they, it's, it's often quoted that they revived indie rock, you know, forever. Yeah. And that's why I've, I said they owe such a debt or so many bands after them owe such a debt to this album because we didn't really know where the, the industry was going. And there was so many different things at the time, so many different products, kind of like in the example of the NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. Though, uh, for the record, I, I do love Backstreet's Back. That is an absolute <laughs> banger. I will sing at I mean, every goddamn karaoke bar I ever attend. Do it up. And babe. I will make everybody join along with me. <laughs> I like that. Uh, <laughs> but I digress. So let's dive into a little bit of the background before we go through the actual LP as we do on these shows from top to bottom. So I want to talk about just just the, uh, focus on a little bit of style and sound. That was actually is that is a perfect segue to basically what was left from what I was like thinking with the overall like why is it so celebrated? All those things behind this unique awesome revival of garage rock. You know what's crazy is like before I actually did a reading on the album when I just like listened to it over and over again that was the very first genre name that came into my head I was like man they really captured this garage rock sound so garage rock sound is often you know they it's punctuated by a live miking side of recording where they would mic you know amps or things like that it wouldn't be done through a MIDI or or pro tools or things of that nature it was old school recording tactics and and um strategies things like that so it always had this kind of rough around the edges essence to it and it was very simple you know they'd often focus on eighth note or 60 note phrasing and of course of course quarter note yeah, phrasing that upbeatness that just da -da 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 -da. like they always have that driving sound exactly so yeah very straight even chord progressions power chords just like fucking bread and butter rock and roll and as i already mentioned the production techniques mirrored that so um like when i was listening to it over and over again before i actually read about the album and it was just like making my notes i was like god this sounds like they are in a room recording these live you know instead of like overdubs after overdubs that we see now which is for the record there's nothing wrong with that you know you know that's how you know, even fucking the Beatles did overdubs and things like that. It doesn't yeah. have to be rock and roll doesn't have to be just, you know, the people in a room recording the song. That's that's the beauty of studio versus live. It's like you can make I mean, it's complete open creativity like it's freedom. You can yeah, do whatever I mean, you want. Overdub stuff, edit stuff, effects, do whatever the fuck you want. Right. And they were clearly, you know, to have that very live sound, you know, the garage rock sound. They yeah, they were singing. They were they the mics were recording the amps and stuff like that. It was never a clean recording of them or as clean as what we get now with like Pro Tools and shit, shit of that nature. Interesting thing, too, about like I think the, the vocals is that not only did that 
extra bit of the distortion in this technique. And again, what, you know, just to paint a slightly more clear picture, I guess, for those who are not like musicians or very technical of mind, literally, like if, if you go to certain types of gigs or, or certain like size of shows, um, you, you might see that, you know, guitarists uh, and, and certain things are like mic'd, like drum kits, like, you know, obviously like, they're all mic'd. The sound check, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. If you go to a concert early enough, you'll kind of see that. But this is like the little tiny room version of it with like literally like a practice amp. Uh, is how Julian Casablanca described what his what the microphone was picking up. So it was going through the microphone out on amp once into another microphone into the actual like rig, you know, like the mother the motherboard, like the brain, you know, control center of it all, uh, where the producer was. So that yeah, that technique was was pretty interesting and obviously again it, it took off like crazy so many people started to go for that like overly mic'd like distorted sound on the vocals it, it was it was iconic uh, and very unique it just again it just blew the lid off of just being like holy crap you can we forgot we can do this or something because it's not like it's never been done uh but just the way it was done was just very brazen and it's interesting the yeah, like that sound being so instrumental to how this album blew up and how this album still stands apart is just that like they didn't really continue that i think that's a perfect segue to talking about mr julian Casa. Blancas for a little bit and his unique vocal approach, not just the how they how they recorded it. Yeah, the musicians are all amazing and technical and like very tight. And then you've got Julian's voice, uh, which even like his pitch and just the way he like he sings is very like the the range is right like in the middle. It's not too high. It's not too low. Um, so it, it even has like that bit of like every man. You know, like people hear it and you love sing along to it. Um, but it also just sounds badass, especially with like, <laughs> extra like layer of the garage. He's rock. got an attitude. Yeah. Yeah. And again, a, it's he's... very like punky in your face, like um, kind of aspect to him, too. Again, he's still got that like that young New Yorker kind of like just take no shit sort of attitude somewhere in there. Yeah. And um, again, on top of just like the way he like he doesn't like sing like right on the notes, you know, like he doesn't always oh, no, just not... go for that. He does. It's <laughs> not the, at all. It's the anti. Um, Auto-tune, honestly, to talk kind of further to your point earlier, too, about how a lot of other stuff was very, like, popish and mainstreamed in general, um, and yet here was this incredibly raw, like, in many different ways, just boom in your face vocals. I didn't put this in the, the notes I sent to you, but because I was kind of writing some extra things today as, as I was listening to the album over and over again. Now, bear with me. All right, go on go on the journey with me because it'll ha- oh, this will have a happy ending. Take me okay, yeah. Take me so he, when I was trying to describe his singing, um, the guy sings off key a lot. He's very pitchy. He's sometimes just flat. Now... That doesn't mean he's a bad singer. I want to make that very, very clear because, you know, just because someone doesn't have traditionally trained pipes, you know, like the the quintessential example, that's an opera singer, right? They're they are an absolute master of, of the vocal singing craft. And someone like Julian Casablancas, who wants to bring, you know, even though he's not perfectly on key or pitch or whatever and, and in perfect harmony the phrasing that's going on with the, the rest of the music that doesn't mean it's bad because throughout time we've we've seen this time and time again because um his vocal has character and like i said you have this badass you know new york city attitude and that is part of the appeal of a vocal approach and aesthetic because i think the gold standard for someone that's often considered a quote-unquote bad singer but it's you know it's no one cares because they're he has created timeless music is bob dylan that's like the number one complaint about like he, the guy can write a song like he's a you know like it's it's not so much like the entire song is trash it's just people when they complain about or if they don't like bob dylan that's just, funny. It's just like, oh, i just can't stand his voice right right and that doesn't mean he's a bad <laughs> singer right yes yeah, it's, it's a stylistic t- he's you know, just, just he's just yeah he's just not focused on making sure that He's perfectly in pitch with the music and et cetera. I mean, you get my point. And so time and time again, we've seen or like Tom Waits, you know, but it it gives them such a unique essence. Like I couldn't even imagine a singer with this band perfectly in key and pitch and just like singing like they're on fucking American Idol to this kind of garage rock sound. I like it just wouldn't it wouldn't be the same. And that's yeah, the beauty of this be album, weird. too. Right. Is they they created a, a sound, even though they wear a lot of their inspirations on their sleeve, like we've already talked about the Velvet Underground, they still sound like the strokes. You know, they they 
they created this very signature sound within that genre of rock and roll and they kind of ran with it that's part of the reason i do want to talk about this before we get into the album that's part of the reason i didn't um want to do a full career piece because i did for the record um i know you would i would you would get mad at me philip you, you wouldn't want to do any shows if i didn't admit the, the the fact that i did listen to the whole thing i listened to every single album they put out and i realized they just were kind of staying in their own lane i didn't see much of an evolution not that again not that that's a bad thing because the gold standard for that is fucking acdc they in my opinion they wrote one song and then they covered themselves for the rest of their career and yeah. uh, sometimes people find a sound and they just stick with it i just that's why i i didn't see the the rest of their catalog as celebrated as this one and really changing the industry overnight. And that's why I wanted to focus on it today. Fair. And I mean, or I guess to be fair on, on behalf of them too, how yeah. often does somebody just like pop up out of nowhere and change this? You know what I mean? Like with yeah. their first oh, yeah. album, like that, that is a big thing to carry on after, I, you know, just to go back to it again, you know, the whole lightning in a bottle, whatever, another word for that, but just one in a trillion kind of like all the circumstances and just the output, like it, it is quite the phenomenon. And that's why, I, it, that's why I love the music is probably one of my, I think it's probably my absolute favorite artistic medium because no other medium is like that where someone like has this like incredible success overnight. And then all these other acts are trying to either, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say copy. I, I like to think that a lot of artists are inspired by it. They're like, oh man, this is kind of the stuff I'm writing. I should keep pushing into this. And before you know it, they fucking, you know, have a breakthrough in their arcade fire or something, something, whatever, whatever example you have in your head. So let's go ahead and go through it. Okay. Let's so uh, is this it from top to bottom? We start off with the title, title track. track. Is this it? Um, this was their uh, attempt at a ballad. <laughs> and um, for I love it. <laughs> yeah, before before I tee you up, I'm just going to say this. The star of this track is the bass line. Yeah, thank down. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, so coming right in, but it, technically this this might very well be like the slowest song on the album. So I like how they didn't even come at us full force. Um, they, they came in with kind of a slow. Yeah, right off the top, you've got complimentary uh, guitar parts as they're really, really great at doing, which I'm sure we'll break down even further. But yes, yeah, it goes from having like pretty melody forward um, lead guitar and regular rhythm, as is very usual for them. But um, the bassist came up with such a sick run that, you know, oh, the guitarist was just like, oh, absolutely. We'll each move to our own like version of like a rhythm line because it just takes it just that kicks the whole thing up a huge notch. It's it is. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant, brilliant bass run. And it's so fun. As I was uh, reading about the the mixing and production of Gordon Raphael, he did he would mix it in real time with them because usually the mixing and mastering is done after it's kind of all done, you know, and they kind of figure out how they want to really complete, you know, polish, yeah. if you will, these tracks they did it in in real time that's part of i think that's how yeah, it they, literally, they the, literally did it in a room with the mic amps together and in, in like a take it was a big solid solitary like take exactly yeah they were they were um five musicians in a room recording their songs singing their like performing their songs and recording them as raw as it gets yeah the the amount again like the amount of practice and accuracy like with them just hammering out their first like whatever it was like a dozen or so songs uh, again, I think that's another reason this album is so awesome is with just how tight it is. Yeah, I've, I've, and um, I guess my point was I've had the pleasure of being in some professional studios before and seeing people actually do this. And um, so you could like just tell that Gordon was like pushing up the bass line in the mix. Like you can hear it. It really comes to the foreground, right? It comes to the foreground. Brought up big time, yeah. And then everything is is in the mids again. Um, and it's still mixed well. Don't get me wrong. It's I, I, a, a lay listener won't even notice. But someone like me and Philip, you know, it's really pushed because it is, God, I mean, this is... This is probably one of the ba my best bass lines I've heard this year. It just comes into my head sometimes because I just think about like how freaking fun it is. Exactly. And um, that leads us to the Modern Age, track number two, which is, uh, again, part of their original EP, which was also entitled The Modern Age. And this is where I feel like their uh, their sound is getting a little bigger. If if anything, Is This It is not only a ballad, but a good introduction. It brings you into the album, but this is where you're fully immersed into the world with the modern age. And um, this is this is the um, a perfect example of how well they crafted these pieces, because on a just a 
you're not, you got one foot in, one foot out kind of listen to, like your first listen to, you probably won't even notice there's a, so, a guitar solo in this song. But I tried to count all the guitar solos and I, I kind of, I actually uh, fell to the whims of my own praise for the album because it's, it's, they're mixed so well that I forgot to count them because they're, they're integrated into the song so f- like, fluidly because when you think of like a traditional guitar solo that's this big epic journey you know a good example is like pink floyd and david gilmour and you're you're going on this huge fucking journey and it's this huge centerpiece and they don't really do that until i would say getting a little ahead of myself the last track take it or leave it yeah the i i really do i've always loved the way that they use um both of their guitarists like to their talents in that um yeah it's like there's there's always a bit more of a lead part and then there's always like a really good rhythm part that is it's so interestingly ha- like ingrained deep within who the strokes are that again that is that like you said the, the either the eighth or the 16th notes a lot of times it is that uh just the it is the driving thing that's also going along with with you know the, the drums that's just giving that like momentum that just keeps you barreling forward through the album because you know, it, it's it's not like the fastest, you know, it's not, obviously we're not talking like actual like punk speeds necessarily, but still, um, again, like nice and upbeat, like pretty decent tempos going on. Oh, yeah. Like, um, I will and, and I, I will get there. So, I think a perfect yeah. example of those interlocking guitar lines is actually the next the next track, Soma. Like when I was listening to this, I was like, you can because you can really hear it in the mix. Well, that you're like, oh, shit. oh, yeah, like like how they play off each other. Uh, with their guitar lines and really fit almost fitting together like puzzle pieces. Yeah, I think that goes back to just the fact that everybody's like a lifelong musician and they've all had like friendships throughout, like not everybody, but still like the overlapping friendships. I I, I bet you the chemistry uh, just still lends itself to being like, oh, hell yeah, you sound cool when you do that. I can do this here. You know, just, yeah, the way that yeah, people that can play off of each other, no. these, these guys are, are an entire unit, but especially the two guitarists, like, they're so good at just enriching their guitar space to where you really can just go back and listen a bunch of times in your good headphones with the volume pretty up, you know, like don't damage your eardrums necessarily. But again, if everybody, if you're hearing this and you don't have a pair of good headphones yet, go get good cans, especially if they're wired. (laughs) I mean, I'm just weirdly old nerd. Like I'm a, my internal 80 year old loves something to plug into something with a wire. (laughs) Bluetooth is cool, but I always trust (laughs) something going through an electric wire all the more. It's never the, it'll never be the same. You need that hard line to really get the perfect fidelity. Yeah. Another, another band who, thanks to the mixing and the talent uh, of the musicians, the mixing uh, by uh, Gordon Raphael is, um, yeah, how the guitars work together so damn well. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I, um, I read that um, Albert Hammond Jr. was, I think, one of the last guys. AHJ? (laughs) <laughs> yes, AHJ. He was one of the last to come in to the to the band. Yep. And the more I kind of studied, you know, especially the solo work and stuff, I think he kind of became part of the brains of at least the musicality and the crafting of the songs. Absolutely. That's my theory. Yeah. You know, I think the other guys, like you said, are are excellent in their own right and they're they're great. They're a great supporting cast. Yeah, the drummer's a beast, and the bassist is also again like clearly keeping up and like putting in with all these dudes. Like everybody's great, but Albert? Oh, yeah. There's always that lead guy that probably was like, oh, well, that was great, you know, but maybe we should try it this way. And it just like fucking illuminates everything, right? It just heightens everything. It kind of also helps showcase this situation where you, the the band almost has like two front men in just how much Albert Hammond Jr. is responsible for their signature stroke sound. Yet it, of course, couldn't be anything without Julian's voice. How that there's always that dichotomy of like the vocals almost get like 50 you know, sometimes maybe we're like 40% of the spotlight, but at the same time, that's a lot of what's going on and that it, you, you like, hence any good album is worth listening to over and over again as you hear the musicality, more of the things that are not the vocals, but, you know, the fact that you've got something that's not both a melody and is giving you words that paint a picture, tell a story, evoke emotions, it just, something about Julian's voice being so good uh, in the way it fits into this niche, this garage rock, this the, like, I almost said slutty, I don't know. Um... <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> slutty. Oh yeah, De- dead on. Um, no, no, you. May- I think it applies in a in a complimentary way. I really do. He just seems like a dude who goes out and just gets it. I don't know. <laughs> oh man, I, I remember girls going crazy for him. 
Oh yeah, oh, no, I definitely remember that. I remember oh man, when, like, so I just think that's something about he's just even his voice is just kind of sexy. It's just like it just it drips. Um, well, so. people, um, I will say this: people forget that vocals are an instrument too. There's vocal melodies, and he, um, especially when we get to the stuff like hard, like, yeah, like, like his yeah, hard to explain too. and stuff like that. He really writes like really catchy, yeah, uh, very complimentary vocal melodies, and um, yeah, his we didn't. We didn't talk about this when we were, we were just focusing on him, but I do want to say this: his um, his choice in lyrics, his his songwriting craft, and his uh, lyricisms are fascinating because to me, it's always been like I, every time I actually read them or listen to them, and or I'm just focusing on them, it's very stream of consciousness. And what I mean by that is like it's clearly like him, his conscience talking essentially to us if if it could and that's that's how i look at his his lyrics because he's always he's always like apologizing for something he doesn't want to waste our time there's some there's a lot of pessimism in there uh but i think it it's fascinating because it's not it's not storytelling to me you know a lot of songs can kind of tell a story like hotel california or something like that where this one is is he's like we're we're getting an inner glimpse into his mind um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Like it is like, that's why I think we should go to barely legal because barely legal is about young love. You yeah. Know? It's not always as direct of a story. It is told more in like in snippets and thoughts and concepts and like things that like, they still paint a picture and tell like you, you're getting all that perspective and opinion, you know, of somebody talking, but it really is almost more like, yeah, like a guy literally like narrating his own night or something as, as opposed to just being literally like, like you just said, like in a in a certain kind of highway, like over in California, like they're literally giving you straight up direct descriptions of things and saying he said this, she said that. Like so many other songs can be far more like actual storytelling, but his is yeah, his is more like point of view. Exactly, yeah, and um, it's and fun barely too. barely legal. I feel like is is a highlight of this kind of um, form of songwriting. Uh, to me, this kind of had a little, kind of glistened a little bit with that new wave eighties kind of version of garage rock. Yeah, and um, those hammer ons, fuck me, those guitar line hammer ons that dan dan nano 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 nano. I just ah, oh, I love that shit. I, it's actually, and speaking of um how strongly that guitar stuff is uh that you're bringing it up in this right now uh i like that they literally also only use the same instruments throughout um mm. again to go back to like that live sound they kind of thing that you've seen yeah. at concerts <laughs> they, well but you know like but even like concerts for instance how i was talking earlier about like oh if you've been to a concert you might have seen like you know uh, people miking amps like for for like guitarists and stuff well another aspect of like live stuff that you do see is when people will be brought like a different guitar you know and then like it's one of those other like subtle things that people who aren't as familiar with music and or production don't like take into account like the tone or this and that but you know like different guitars literally can have very very different sounds uh depending on just how like your musical ear kind of is and these guys used just the one guitar their way through the whole album, which still goes to speak with like the sort of variety in the different, like, even though they're always in their wheelhouse of that awesome, you know, like again, garage, New York rock, like fun party scene stuff that they've got. It's still all told kind of like how Julian has his one voice. Well, these guitarists only use the one guitar, you know, so you can only manipulate its tone and its stuff so much before you start getting into overly heavy production techniques, which I think still just goes to how raw and straightforward the music is and why it just hits so good. Yeah, that's a good point because people, yeah, I, I I realize, you know, sometimes we're a little too close to these to these things. People probably don't realize uh, that like something like a Fender, it has a completely different quote unquote tone yeah. than a Gibson. Yeah, like Fender know? Gibson is basically like, you know, if you're not that big of a guitar music These are person, guitars, sorry. Be like, as, it's like, yeah, it's like saying, you know, like a Chevy or a Ford or like a Sony or a Samsung, um, you literally have just as many guitar brands and types and like guitar brands themselves than the strings on the guitar. Like there's all these things that go into making your sound. And these these dudes just were like, well, I'm using this amp with this guitar. And that was literally <laughs> it for the album. So it's like, they're so damn good at what they do that it still just like works the whole time without having like shaking things up too much. Yeah. And that, that brings us to track number five someday. And, um, the big, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, one of the first singles off of the album and, or, or one of these singles off the album. And, uh, though, uh, I will say this to, 
to start this discussion of this track. Uh, though they, yes, we said it many times, we'll say it before, they get compared to the Velvet Underground a lot, but I actually thought they sounded more like the Stooges, you know, with Iggy Pop on this particular track. I, I, I get that. Actually, I do. Um, that makes that makes pretty good sense uh, with how, you know, this for some reason, it being like a single, maybe this had some kind of different specific intent in the songwriting because um, it is it's even got like it's got a brighter tone to it. You know, again, a lot of the other ones still sound like you're being dragged along through a party. Maybe you do or don't want to go, depending on which song. Um, it literally all sounds very narrative and like experiential. Um, this one has a bit more of a like intentionally a beat or kind of just broader appeal to it. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, it was it was it was brighter um the the keys that you know more ma- major scales kind of thing like that. And I think even the musicality and the song structure itself was a little more was a little brighter and a little more diverse if you will because they had that excellent drum and bass break right in the middle. You know, it it kind of it, it was essentially a bridge, but it just that that part was like quintessential late 60s, 70s rock when it was just the drum and the bass. And it was just like, you know, Fleetwood Mac, t- what, one chord or like two or three notes on the bass. And they were just kind of filling in that bridge section and they went right back into the groove. So. Yeah. And even the rest of the song is is also it's so damn straightforward and, and simple. And like there's there's nothing ever bad about simple songwriting. Think about the main thing. It's just three notes, like the main melody of just dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. That's three, literally just three notes, just in certain timing and pacing. Like, oh my god, you're not like blowing anybody's minds, but it's just it's so good and how simplistic it is. And even the vocal melody follows that. It's it's a little less complex as some of the other things that they've structured in their songs. Like you were saying too, how there's like a lot of songs with a lot of solos and interweaving solo like or lead parts. Like this one is way more just it's it, it it's the quote unquote poppiest thing on the album because of how. Uh, like even to taken back, it is for. You think it's strokes. more poppy than last night? I feel like last night is still the poppy. You know, last night. Yeah, it's it's more boisterous and it's a little more fun. It's got more that like punk slash like rockabilly to it, whereas this yeah. one's a little like more sixties rock, like you said. Um, yeah, and yeah, I mean, it's I don't know. It, it's just again, it's a little brighter. It's it. Uh, last night is still awesome and also upbeat, but it's got that harder like. This guitar, the guitar solo in that one, for instance, like it's full of like the bends and it's a little skankier and like it's it's even Julian's like not just going. Now, before we get there, we got to talk. We got to talk about track six, which is alone True. together. All right. But uh, the, because... the, the vocals in last night, I'm just going to wrap this point up real quick. The the vocals in last night are more in your face and, 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 and intense, too. Some days way more. It's it's drawn back it's like more intentional oh uh, well i didn't want to skip over track six alone together because it's my favorite song on the whole goddamn album have we got to your favorite song yet or are we still are we still gonna get there it's really really hard to pick one i do actually think that alone together is one of my favorites oh god yeah it, because of that riff this goes yeah, back that... to having like the more complex guitar stuff that i yeah, go ahead and gush that, that was my first note on this track is that fucking riff oh my god i just the, the guitarists tear it up uh this one gets pretty wild uh but even from the get-go the the sweet riffing like it's just it's just good shit i feel like it's uh it's a culmination of everything that they were doing so excellently in uh the previous tracks and that's why um you know if you guys listening have uh listened to our other uh reviews on on albums uh, i talk about centerpieces a lot that's why it's exactly to a t right in the middle it's a centerpiece because yeah. i probably i think they probably thought five it was tracks their four and five songs. tracks after they probably thought it was one of their their stronger pieces and it, it, just, it just really shines in the middle i think it, it it's a perfect bridge to the album itself and um that riff it's the kind of track that you know obviously they didn't make it a single but a non-single piece like this I feel like if you get into the album, you'll find yourself listening to that one over and over again compared to Someday, Last Night, or what we haven't gotten to yet, hard to explain. Uh, it's just um, it's just a perfect tune through and through. It has the interlocking guitar lines, just like a lot of the other tracks, but to this, yeah, just this overdrive power chord wonderland of fun. And uh, it's the, it's the track I listen to the most. It's it is interestingly sandwiched between the two big smash hits too. It literally goes someday, then this one alone together, which is pretty rad. And I, I would I would bet that 
in that interesting way how artists, of course, always like view their work in, in different ways and they're going to be like proud of certain things that may not always be the hits. I wouldn't be surprised if this was also something that they cited as like one of their like more favorite songs from this album. Mm, uh, again, yeah. I, I I love the the play the way the guitars play off each other, and again, just just more fun like kind of shredding type of riffs that the the, the guitarists do in this one too. Yeah, and then and then that that does lead us to track number seven, last night, and um, spelled N I T E. <laughs> this uh, oh, drum line me. that starts the song is. Um, a is a drum line I still to this day will practice just to kind of warm up. It's like perfect. It's like it's simple but incredibly tasteful. Like it's like just that just that perfect um, four in the floor rock groove. Yeah, and it's I think this is uh, there's not much I don't I don't have a ton to say about last night. You've already made some good points. It's a great track. I think I, there's a reason it's it's a it's a single. It's it's an absolute highlight. It's so much fun. It's um, I think it also kind of encompasses a lot of their this quintessential sound that they created on this first album yeah both last night and alone together um both dial up the distortion over julian's voice again um it's interesting how again that's something else that they play with with his double miking technique on this one and uh yeah again it's just it's it's fun and you're just it's a whirlwind um it's it's a little more even vocally like towards like a, a an actual story of like time references um, you know, like uh, certain events happening or like people talking like it, it's it's not quite as uh, abstract as some of his other like sort of songs and lyrics. Um, so again, more approachable there. Yeah. again, it's just more in your face. It's fun. It's it's just upbeat as heck. Major key. Yeah. It's just got all, all the hallmarks of like a, just a good, fun song. Uh, track number eight is hard to explain. Um, now, I read that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Philip. I read that everything was done acoustically, but this drum line, man, it sounds a lot like a drum machine drum line. Like, unless they perfectly got that. that it was intentional. That, 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 yeah. Um, sound. You th- so you think it's an intentional that um, that Moretti created the, the drum line acoustically to sound like a drum machine? I do. Uh, I literally think that I uh, read somewhere that that was um, something that for, they just thought would be fun is that like he's he's so like accurate. The drummer uh, is damn good. And he's so like on point that they were like, I bet you you know, we could literally just make you sound like a drum machine with a little bit of extra production so that it sounds a little more like it's coming out of like a MIDI, you know, or like something like, yeah, it sounds sound like, more MIDI by like really clamping down like on rolling 808. Yeah, exactly. It does. Yeah. But um, no, it's, it's still the drummer. They didn't swap out a drum hmm. machine. It's literally just that they, they clamped down on, on his post-production stuff to where they reduced the sound to where it sounds fake, but it's yeah. still him. Interesting. I like that. Well, I like I'm glad you knew that because I really wanted to. Um, yeah, I wanted to learn the history. And um, yeah, so that's an absolute highlight. The baseline again, this guy, God, he's a little he's a little secret weapon, you know, when you do you hear him through yeah. the mix. The whole band is fire. Uh, it's just that guitars and other things often will take the spotlight from, you know, other other stuff. But yeah, the bassist crushes in this band. Yeah. And the um, and then again, like I already said previously, this is a, a perfect example of how he how uh, Julian Casablanca's crafts a vocal melody. Like, I think this is this is really smart yeah. vocal melody writing right here. Besides, I mean, even if you don't even read the lyrics or listen to the lyrics, it doesn't matter. You know, we, we've talked about this in other shows. It's like when you use it as an as- actual instrument, yeah, things are kind of muddied, you know, in, in, the, in how he sings. You can't really pinpoint exactly what he's saying. Well, but it this is matter. especially bad of an album for me. I actually have that problem a lot, being able to understand lyrics. But good Lord, this album took me so long to like really have to listen to to be like, I finally you know what he's saying. pull them up and read them? Nah, sometimes I get, I'm pretty stubborn. I, I want to like, <laughs> okay. I want to like listen to it. And I just, something about like having the sounds in my head. I was like, ah, this is fun this way. Okay. Um, oh, but yeah, it, it, this enough. one made it extra difficult to like understand um, the lyrics because of just how we can just wash Sometimes it was with his double miking, but yeah, it overall st- really cool. And I, I do like you said earlier too of like how much of the flavors Albert Hammonds. I wonder how much this was them coming up with a melody together, or if even Albert like played something and Julian just kind of sang it back because they don't always do the same or even like interplaying uh, melodies directly. But this one very much is like both the guitar. And Julian's vocal melody is like, like it's the same. Yeah. 
Yeah, just just another like very intentional thing that ha- had to be like thought through. But yeah, I actually this is one of my favorites. Um, and I think there part of it go. is the unique okay. sound of the drums in this one. I've again, I've always kind of been perplexed or just drawn by that how they sound. Yeah, it's very specifically crafted in this one. But uh, I also looked that up when I was looking into the production techniques because I was like, they wouldn't just randomly do that. It doesn't make sense. So like, what was the thought? And they were just like, no, we thought it'd be fun. He, you know, like, and I agree. It's like their drummer is great. He's incredibly accurate. I love his relaxed style. Like, he doesn't do anything insanely simple but flashy. tasteful. Yeah, yeah, it's just he's so. He's a pocket player. Yeah. Um, he's a pocket player. He barely fills. He barely hits his crashes, and that is often a a staple of a mark of not only a pocket player but a good uh, songwriter. Like, he always wants to make sure that the parts he writes. Uh, helps the overall composition. And yeah, he doesn't want to be the star. Yeah, he doesn't want, yeah, there's no reason to like, smash a big symbol here and there. Like, he knows when to do it. He knows when to open it up and go to the, like, ride, you know, like, ride the crash for a bit. Just, like, it's it's still all there. Exactly. That brings us to track number nine, which is we hinted at uh, a little bit of the history in our um, background section. So this, um, if you hear it on Spotify, you're going to hear When It Started, which is a track that they wrote later to fill in uh, a track called New York City Cops. Now, the reason they did this is because, so you like on uh, vinyl pressings, or I think even some international pressings, you're going to have the album the exact same up until hard to explain. But when you get to track nine, it'll be New York City Cops. Everywhere in the US, it'll be when it started. And they did that because um, they released this originally in July, um, yeah, July 30th, 2001. But the vinyl or, or some of the U.S. stuff didn't come out until after 9-11. Yep. And they, they didn't want to be disrespectful to the cops at that time because the, the song's kind of insulting if you listen to yeah, it. Yeah, it literally just, the lyrics are, they're not that smart. They're not that smart, right. They're just saying it over and over again. Where it's funny because like, so I got so used to listening to the album with when it started. Yeah. And it's such a sad bad fucking it's such a downer song that like new york city cops though the the imagery and the lyricisms is pretty shitty to the cops it's it's a much grindier garage rock fun you know it it's like a power court charge it, it struck me as like the third like almost like major hit that like i remember it standing out a lot like someday and last night to me yeah um, so yeah it another it's, big it's, boisterous like it's crazy that um Probably most people haven't even heard the song too yeah. in the U.S. Uh, if they they listen to the original CD yeah, pressings back, back or when the, you had to buy albums, <laughs> right? Exactly. And so it's fascinating to see the dichotomy of how that that changed over time. Um, and then um, the last two tracks are are solid. Um, number ten is "Trying Your Luck." Again, an excellent example of the interlocking guitar lines. And I on track eleven, "Take It or Leave It," I find myself just yelling the the Julian Casablanca's version of how he says that. I'll take it. I'll yeah. leave it. Like I'll, I'll just like I'll yeah, I'll just like hear that in my head sometimes when I'm driving and I'm like, now this is the only time in the whole album where a, a guitar solo stuck out to me. That like was really this like shining beacon of light of like, oh wow, this is an epic guitar solo whereas throughout the out al- the other the, the rest of the album, I could bet a lot of money that a lay person listening wouldn't even notice the solos. And I think that's probably that probably is intentional. I don't know for sure. They're incredibly meat and potatoes. They're just like pentatonic. Again, like nothing special technically. But it's special with the, again, the sound they created yes. between the vocals. There's also the, nothing and, wrong. And the again, they're not the bad mic-ing. solos. I'm yeah. not saying they're like, oh, they're crap. It's just that like they're literally just not crazy notes on one of the most simplest scales, and like maybe some bends, if even like a bend here. Like it's just, it, it, it's not trying to be anything too complicated. No, you you said it perfectly. Meat and potatoes. So uh, that that brings the album to a close and uh, <laughs> changing the uh, the music industry into the 21st century forever. Now, um, before we move on to the kind of the conclusion sections and stuff, and kind of I think of this first album, I do want to uh, touch on the uh, the discography context a little bit yeah. because they did have you know. They did have quite a long career after I'm, this. Yeah, I'm and still so, a big fan of all their other albums. Uh, so let's go through them real quick. I'm just going to name them off. If you want to give a little feedback on, on some of your highlights, please do so. But in 2003, they made Room on Fire. 
2005, they made First Impressions of Earth. And then this is when I um, part of their history is some of the solo work Julian Casablancas did. His uh, solo LP is called Phrases for the Young, 2009. They went back to the Strokes in 2011 to make Angles. I actually really liked this awesome one. Awesome album. Yeah, I really like this one after the first two LPs. Uh, Come Down Machine in 2013. And then uh, Julian Casablancas went solo again to make you know, almost like a different strokes stroke, like band strokes yeah. alternate universe. Like it's it, called it, the it, voids. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, they made two LPs in 2014. That's tyranny and, uh, just the void it's still good and, stuff it's still good stuff i agree it's really not that far off if you like the strokes like you really might still like the voids and then in uh 2020 they made the new abnormal which is a a, a bit of a return to form yeah, i thought that was actually really, like thought, that one more than come down machine i liked um yeah i think of their later work angles i'm a big fan of angles, angles is amazing a close second would be the new abnormal but it still didn't room on fire in my opinion was very much like somehow like a leftover slash like continued thought off of the first one i feel like phase one of their career was albums one and two uh is this is it in room on fire those two are the most the same to my in my opinion because from there the differences between the albums is is more in that um first impressions of earth was already like a far like different sort of structure or like songwriting techniques um than the first two uh that were like very uh again understandable digestible like homage rock if you will you know just to put it a different way first impressions was was again it grew on me i liked it more and more over time angles the second i heard it i loved it though that one was amazing still not like the first two though that's what's so interesting again like that era of the classic strokes if you will of room on fire uh even sounding i think like very much like it was like a 2.0 good yeah exactly. talked about very this follow-up i feel again i feel like it's a side a and b kind of thing almost yeah it's kid a and kid b of radiohead yeah it's the same thing like where i, I felt like ah this isn't a really big departure. Yeah. And I feel like they tried to do something a little bit different with first impressions of earth and it just kind of fell flat. And then I felt like they're like, you know what, let's just kind of go back to what we know. And they, probably the only, I will say this, the only thing that really evolved over their career in a good way, in a good way was the production. Yeah. You know, we went from garage rock to really polished produced rock. Um, not, not a bad thing. I'm not saying that as a bad thing. It's just um, there. That was probably the biggest change over the years. I was, like more polished personally. So, I mean, I, I personally, agree. I do too. Yeah. That's again, like it's all, everything is, sub, you know, it's all subjective. Of course, it's all just tastes like it's all good stuff, but I personally like their cleaner sound towards like, the, like literally angles is my favorite strokes album. Ah, okay. We, we, it, it, it has been revealed. Well, the new abnormal was produced. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong by Rick Rubin, one of the most mm -hmm. celebrated, uh, uh, as far um, as I know. Yeah, the best one of the best producers <laughs> alive, a living legend. And so that's probably why it is so well produced and so polished, things of that nature. So before we uh, tie, tie a bow on the speed, I know you like when I say that. <laughs> um, I do want to talk about uh, the legacy a little bit and framing it with this statement. There is sometimes the what I call the curse of the first album triumph. And I think uh, they got a little bit of that with Is This It? Because, so here's the thing, guys. You know, a lot of artists don't know what's going to happen when they put their art into the world, especially musicians. They don't know if it's going to be a big hit or a big dud. So um, often musicians will put everything they want into a vision for their sound into that first LP. And it, sometimes they get into this trapping, especially in this, in, in this example, it being this huge fucking incredible hit across the boards commercially critically everything like that and then they can't they have such a hard time reproducing that again and i i feel like you know we often see that with the the second lp slump they they don't know what to do creatively because they put everything into the first album yeah I, that's why i think the second one still sounds kind of like the first one you think so you think i, I, I don't think, think i don't think the slump was the second lp i think first impressions of earth was the the slump uh, again it, that one did grow, have to grow on me over time because it's not as cohesive it, it's yeah. like and it's more experimental as far as the strokes goes um not that they're like pushing the the, the bounds of experimental stuff but I, I i i think room on fire is a lot of the same it's from the it's, from the first album is it, this and, a 2.0 so for sure th that's why i think it's in a weird way <laughs> yeah like the fact that they're they really should just be like a side a side b kind of thing is why i i think technically 
I by default still consider Ruman Far to be kind of a, a, sec- a second slump. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that's fair. That's fair. Um, now, um, so let's let's go ahead and tie a bow on this. B. Uh, tell the good people. Um, and I, I usually uh, give my guest the floor to uh, completely conclude alone, but I do have a little something. Um, so, yeah, tell the good people why they need to uh, celebrate. Is this it? It never doesn't slap. And the fact that it is so like brief, I think just something about how incredibly like consumable it is um hmm. it is in just just about every way like the i like an, an, an ideal listen in in certain scenarios um again like it's fun it's quick you know it's it's weirdly relatable uh yet it also has an like so many layers to where even if you are not as casual of a music listener but really again like we'll sit there and obsess over you know the guitar parts and the this stuff and and you know again like go back and listen over and over again it's interesting how you really like it's so hard to get bored of it and, and it's all just incredibly well written produced um there's yeah there's just such a crazy like come out of nowhere kind of thing with this album that uh yeah it's it's there was more than just the music like the music's still great to this day basically it's like I can't commend the musicians like enough, but for it to have this big of a splash is part of how this album felt. And I think that's just part of what's always going to be with it is that that like the emotion, uh, just something that coming out of like left field and this just, you know, being like the the record scratch of the of the music scene, just being like, it's like the strokes just come <laughs> out of nowhere. Uh, that So I think that's just part of what what's always going to make this album continue to like just hit like it does is it has that extra bit of like cultural uh relativism uh rel- or relativity i should say um i don't know is relativism a relevance. Word? what the hell did i just say <laughs> relevance um, I think you're yes thank about. you jesus <laughs> what would i do without you <laughs> no oh god that was going so well i gotcha so i gotcha I'll give yeah you the again I'll, I'll just leave it there that the, like there's that cultural splash that it made on top of just still being a musically solid album through and through absolutely and i think um what i what i want to add to that is um well put perfectly put it, i think um this album you know as we already articulated the lightning in a bottle example or the watershed uh, example and i i also think uh, please do yourself a musical favor specifically music because this is a perfect example of why you have to study all ends of the musical spectrum to become a well-rounded student in this field because this medium is unlike any other thing because you have to to truly become well-rounded and understand why something like this is so celebrated you have to not only study it because just like i said near the intro or the discussion section you know i'm I'm definitely not the biggest fan of the strokes on the planet, but I wanted to understand why this was so loved and celebrated. And I definitely understand more now than ever, especially from a historical context. And that's what matters is when, if you really want to pursue music as a passion, a love, something that goes way beyond anything you could ever think of, especially for your day job and in life itself, you have to study all aspects of it. And you have to go to these lanes you know, way on on the rock and roll end of the spectrum. But don't forget the other side, you know, just like I was joking about the pop world and sync and all that stuff. You got to listen to the top 40 too. So that, I think that's important. And that's the take home message I want to give to the people today is when you study these things, study this, but also study the other things, because then you'll, you'll, you'll find that. And uh, just to bring it back to your point, Philip, that relativity, you'll, you'll start to understand why. And then when you learn about the history of it, it'll really come together and it'll shine a whole new light on this kind of this kind of stuff and probably the other stuff that you've fallen in love with over the years to throw an interesting little bit of context out there actually just to like for instance like speaking of you mentioned radiohead this is when amnesiac came out 2001 system of downs toxicity which i love came out in 2001 tools lateralis came out in 2001 oh jay's d's the blueprint yeah it was it's amazing like gorillas it's so um, eclectic yeah such an eclectic it's it really was an interesting time and i part of it could just be our even our own age you know like with where we are as far as like i again i'm in my mid-30s just to be a little vague about it but to to paint like what this (laughs) no no, no, he's like he's like 21 guys i'm i'm both he's like 80 at the same time it's very he's a baby i'm a child (laughs) but yeah i uh just to put some more like relativity and 
uh, uh, you know, how how I even might feel about this album is just how, again, like it helped define that part of my youth. And that's the historical context again. You grew up with it in a way, you know, and people tend to love the things they grew up with. Yeah. And it and because it, yeah, it does change and shape and kind of there's identity in it. It it changes who you are as a person with those things. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I want to thank you guys for listening. I want to thank my guest, of course, Mr. Philip Church. Oh, thank you. Church. Fill up with one L. Come on now. (laughs) I think I have my SEO to catch for two. So you know what, guys? I won't I won't be mad if you still find me. (laughs) Find them. Find them what find them at what do sells or one L. Just find them. That's important. It's it's, you know. (laughs) Uh before we go, of course, you know we got a little extra for you. A little icing on the cake, a little cherry Mm -hmm. on top with what we call the gym of the week. If you don't know what the gym of the week is, if you're new to the show, it's it's essentially the things we like to talk about here at the end that don't always fit into the scheme of the episode, but we want to tell you nonetheless. It may be on our radar in the last uh, day or so, week or so, month or so, but we want to give it to you guys so you guys can dig deeper. Before we dive in, of course, you need to hear from their sponsor. Uh, Today's gems are brought to you by Zencaster. Zencaster is our go-to tool for remote podcast recordings. What's great is that you can record separate audio and video tracks, and it's all backed up on a secured cloud, so you never lose your hard work. Even better, it's easy to use, and there's nothing to download. So go to zen.ai, that's Z-E-N dot A-I slash Art of the Beholder, or just use promo code Art of the Beholder, and get 30% off your first three months with a pro account. Now back to the gems. Mine is short and sweet uh, because I had a really hard time thinking of one this episode. And um, I think you've talked about it in a, in a, in one of our shows as a gym. I believe Ryan has talked about it at, in one of the shows as a mm, gym. I'm so curious. And yeah. I, um, I kept saying, I got to get around to seeing this movie. It is the film, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes. And it was it was fucking excellent just like everyone said it exactly it your life it is exactly what how everyone has described it i don't really need to say much more uh than just see it if you haven't seen it go see it i i have a a quick one and actually really just two quick ones um the new predator movie uh prey oh yes it's actually good? good yeah i liked it i i love i as a fan of the yeah as a fan of the franchise i was trying to keep the bar low um but i was <laughs> you, still- you have to after the fucking yeah. crossovers and stuff uh, actually Actually, I liked the second crossover. I liked I liked Rec, the one called Requiem. It was more just like how many humans can we kill in awesome ways. That one was badass. There wasn't really a plot. It was just fun. But also, um, big praise so far. I'm only two episodes in, but Sandman because I love Neil Gaiman. Um, his this. Did you read the this, comics? Yes, I have this. Okay. I have this. It's 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 fantastic. It is so wide ranging. It is insanely creative. Uh, the fact that we're finally at a place where we can pretty ad- adequately and like fairly represent this on screen kind of blows my mind in a way because like having loved and looked up to the source material and stuff like it for so long being such like a I, I love comics and graphic novels and stuff too so yeah it, it's 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 cool so two episodes in i'm really happy with it as, as like a, a pretty big fan of it uh the original stuff and very excited to keep watching it so that's that's my other gem in that it's an ongoing gem. Oh, very good. All right. Well, well, you'll have to tell us uh, again. You know, once you get to the end, you can you can close that circle as we Does like. Does that to be mean here. you're gonna have me back? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, well, we got to talk Geiger. That's a little, oh, yeah. a little wink, a little trailer for an upcoming show. Uh, we'll talk about it when we get off. Uh-huh. So if you like that, guys, you can of course check out some of our stuff. Um, you can check out our products at novodayproductions.com there you'll find things like the entropy sessions as already stated um adulteration post meridium cancel culture lotto of course ads for this show and more to come uh so don't forget to like and subscribe and do all the fucking things you know what to do uh you can follow us at at underscore novo underscore day and at novo day media and if you'd like to sponsor our little love child here you can of course reach out to us at novo day media at gmail.com if you want to get a hold of mr philip church for his services philip tell the good people how you can do it if you want to reach me go to philipchurch.tech um uh, you know i was gonna make a jingle but uh it just doesn't work Ooh. the same <laughs> doesn't. Wait for it. Uh, you know it. I could, uh, maybe next time uh, but almost freestyled a jingle i decided against it last second philipchurch.tech uh one l i i still don't know if i own for two l's but i probably should just buy them both and make them both route to the single l that's smart yeah um yeah but if you also happen to search for like you know narrator or voice actor like you'll find those things because hey seo is fun uh, thanks, <laughs> uh, website provider who I will not plug here for copyright reasons. Um, <laughs> philipchurch.tech. Uh, it's got demos and, and 
all my past audiobooks, uh, some of which you might also find on certain uh, websites that have been mentioned here. Do all the things. Don't forget, philipchurch.tech. So until next time, guys, be good to each other. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love ya. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions. Created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media, at Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company, facebook.com slash ACO Music 123, ACO on Spotify. Logo design by Tom Justice, J E S T U S, of thejusticecompany.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved. Yeah,